Okay, um, so we continue with the second talk of the session. This talk will be held by uh, Peter Af uh, Geierstam. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, so everybody, a lot of people develop software and this talk is about what you should do while still in the development cycle. Uh, folks, please sit down and stop talking. Hey there at the back, thanks. Um, so what you should do while still in your development cycle, not to become Sony or even worse, Adobe. Have fun. Okay, welcome. Uh, nice to see so many people here. I hope you enjoyed the conference. I've really enjoyed it so far. It's my first time here. And uh, I'm here to talk about security mistakes in software development. Uh, and I have, I have a vision that software uh, security needs to come from the inside. It's, it's not only doing pen testing or hacking. The people doing uh, the development has to be aware of the problems that we are facing. And the, the bad thing is that there are two separate worlds. Not that many hackers are software developers by, by perfection, and not many software developments are involved in hacking or security testing or whatever we should say. So this is my, my small contribution I'm trying to present. It's not really uh, like the old WASP uh, top 10, but it's, it's somewhat similar. Uh, 10 common si situations where I have found in my experience uh, that mistakes are made that leads to software uh, security problems in the finished products. So first, some, some information about me, 30 seconds to get to know me a little bit better. Uh, I've been working in the software industry for about 15 years, uh, mostly doing software development, but I've always concentrated in, in the security side of the development. Uh, I'm currently working for a company called Factor 10. Uh, we do ma mainly software renovation. We go in when there is too much pain in continuing development to try to restore uh, order into, into really bad broken code bases. And I can tell you that you find really lots of interesting security stuff when you're looking at old code. Other important choices in my life, I prefer Coke. Uh, when I'm not drinking Coke, I, as uh, some of you noticed yesterday, I prefer wine. Browser-wise, I mostly do Chrome. OS-wise, I have mostly been working with these two guys. That, that might change soon, I think. And language-wise, I have been working with pretty much everything, uh, on and off. Uh, the last year or so, I've been working with um, C Sharp and CoffeeScript doing uh, web apps. Much fun to be had there. So that's 30 seconds about me. Oh, one more other thing. Uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin. If you're, uh, if you're not aware of these concepts, these be because they're hand happening uh, rather exciting things last weeks with these two. Uh, if anyone has any ideas and want to talk about this, I'm all ears. Just grab me anytime. Uh, I would love to hear what you think about it. But I'm in this camp right now. I uh, think there's good promise for that. So let's start with number 10. And I've tried to find some quotes for each of these. And it's really hard to find good quotes regarding security. But this is one I found. To be more successful, study failures. So anyone has a guess what, what this topic could be? This is, this is what most of you guys do every day. You try something, it fails. You try something else, it fails. And you study the failures and you succeed. But this particular topic is logging. It's, uh, it's an area that's often overlooked. And when you're de developing your application, if you have no or bad logging, you're not alone. You're far from alone. And there's no reason why, why it should be like that. Uh, because it's really hard to find out what's happening inside the application without proper logging. And it ends up with you as the developer entering print line hello, print line hello too what I call Norwegian debugging. Uh, it's, not, it's not really practical because 
if you start doing proper logging at the start of the project and get all your developers to enforce proper logging, you'll earn a lot. It'll be easier for them to develop. The testers have more, more information to go for to send with the bug reports. Hey, I did this. Here's the attached log with the information that you want. Of course, you know what you want as a developer. And after deployment, of course, invaluable to find pen testing, to find other bugs. So how should you do the logging? In, in my opinion, you should do your logging really lightweight. Uh, you should have a dynamic behavior at runtime. You should be able to uh, step up the logging without restarting the application. You should have a flexible destination. You should be able to send your log files not only to disk, you should be able to send them to another system because your production systems might not ha handle the, the log load that you are sending if you enable like trace logging. And while th uh, writing your logging, uh, Statements think this question, who did what when? That's a good start. And don't forget to log the administrative operations. Really common to just log the user stuff and forget about the admin stuff. Some example, uh, not, not that easy to find a good example of logging, not a fun one in any way. So I came up with this. This is a World War II bomb plane. And what does this have to do with logging, you might ask? Well, during the Second World War, lots and lots of bomb planes were sent out from Great Britain to, to drop bombs, and not of all of them returned, of course. And they were trying to add more armor, but if they added armor to an entire plane, it would be impossible to carry any bombs. So being a government, and governments are pretty good at logging stuff, so they, they had pretty good books of what planes went out, what planes got home, and they had maintenance log on where are the bullet holes. So they used that information, where are the bullet holes on the planes that get, got back, to, inter, uh, to extrapolate to where are the bullet holes on the planes that didn't get back. So that's, that's an example of having good logging you can even deduce stuff by looking in what's not in your logs. Uh, some benefits of good logging, of course, security, uh, easier debugging, and it helps with some compliance issues as well. But there is something I would say that is too much logging. And I'll give you an example of that. This is from the Free Radius project. They have settings that enable you to log all the bad passwords. Okay, I can live with that but the setting that logs the plain text password of all successful attempts might be too much, in my opinion. Moving on to number nine. Anyone who considers arithmetical methods of producing random digits is, of course, in a state of sin. This was said by John von Neumann, a really, really <laughs> clever guy photographic memory, uh, invented game theory, uh, was part of the Manhattan Project, developed the atom bomb. Uh, bright guy, probably knows what he's talking about, uh, and I'm talking about the use of random numbers in applications. So an example here, uh, somewhat related to the, the previous talk uh, with password reset and stuff like that. You've all seen these kinds of forms when you forgot your passwords. Hey, email, email me a reset link. You click it, get an email, you get a link with some funky codes, and you fire up your cool Netscape browser, and you can enter a new password. But what we have to look at here is, this could be any cookie as well, of course, but you have a name and you have a secret value, and you have to figure out how is this value produced? Well, if we look at Stack Overflow, this is a Java example of how, how that could be, present, uh, be constructed. You get, grab a new random number generator, you iterate over some numbers, use that as an index into an array of, of characters, and you build your string. Okay, so I used this one, and wrote a program that spat out two 10-character codes consecutively. At this year's Black Hat, there was a cool talk uh, by two guys from Silence where they presented a tool called the Prankster. 
Uh, I don't think that the talk got that much atten attention because it had a really strange name. It was something like black box, box testing of pseudo -num random number generators, something like that. But the implications were pretty cool. So what they did was a tool that are, it isn't that user friendly though, uh, enables you to enter one of these, one of these uh, codes and it reverses what initial seeds for the random number generator could have been used to produce that code. So in this example, we say, oh, this is probably Java application, and this could be the, the alphabet used. And it gives us two initial seed values. We then use that seed value, the first one, and skip 10 characters, because we, we, we took 10 characters already, and we get another seed value. This is the internal state of the random number generator, and we feed that back in, and we get out the next code, the next 10 character code. This happens to be the, the, the wrong one. So we try the another, the another uh, initial seed and we get the next generated secret code. And what they did with this was using web apps, they requested a password reset for themselves and then immediately afterwards requested a password reset for the admin user. And then they just guessed the secret value or calculated it backwards. They got a few, few uh, candidates, easy to try, and they can change the, the admin user's password. Really, really clever stuff. Uh, you should check it out. So when using random numbers in applications, be, beware of how you use it, when you use it, and, how, uh, and why you use it. And if possible, use some secure random number generator. It's secure right now. Who knows in the future? So just be careful. Number eight. Who remembers everything about somebody? I know the quotes are terrible, but then again, there, there aren't that many quotes about security. So what could this possibly about, be about? Any guesses? Could be about backups, but they are pretty much always pretty well protected. This is about version control systems. And these guys are really good at remembering stuff. They are an, an essential part of the software development process. You tag your bug fixes, your commits, your features in everything. You use branches and it's, it, it, one of the centerpieces of, of modern software engineering. But what happens if you happen to commit a password to the version, uh, version control system and you somehow you, you, you find out and you go and you remove it in a later commit? Well, it's a version control system. The, the file is always there and if, if someone has branched your, your uh, or forked your, your branch, that password is in the, in the other branch. And stuff like this has happened during this year. Uh, GitHub enabled a feature where you could search through all the repositories, uh, which led to the people started searching for, for SSH keys and found them, of course, so they had to kill the search. Uh, somewhat related to Amazon, uh, people were leaving sensitive credentials inside their Amazon AMIs, publicly uh, packaged uh, virtual machines. So st stuff like this happens all the time. Of course, GitHub knows about this, uh, and they have a page about it, and they say, eh, it's uh, fairly simple to remove the file from the entire history. Well, I wouldn't say it's fairly simple. It's doable, but it's kind of a funky command. But it's not just GitHub, it's, it's your own version control systems, whatever they may be. So when you get home, take a look at them. If you're proficient in scripting, it's really, really easy to just step through each revision and search through every file. I've done it a couple of times for a couple of interesting GitHub repos. Um, you can find some nasty stuff in there, really. Number seven.
This is not related to the keynote speech, even though it's uh, somewhat familiar. Uh, this is talking about protocols. So let me give you an example. You have somehow, you, you need an application where it should, that should be presenting an RSS feed. It could be a desktop application, it could be a web application, whatever. And you have a configuration where you enter which, which, new, uh, which uh, RSS feed it's supposed to, to display. And we have good framework support for these kinds of operations in, in all modern languages. Java has the URL connection, C Sharp has the web client, PHP, God forbid, has the file get contents. So it's really simple to read a URL and use it. The problem is not that, it's n the problem is not your protocol, HTTP or HTTPS. The problem is all other protocols. Remember the URL? URLs are not only HTTP and HTTPS. They are handled inside the languages by protocol handlers. Yova, for example, has HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, file, and jar. So yeah, you could uh, do this in Java. Eh, works fine. C Sharp, a bit more. FTP file, mail to, NetPipe, NetTCP news, NNTP, Gopher. Anyone used that in the last 20 years? <coughs> it's there. But you can do this. You can read a local file and it works. And if you don't know that the web client clause in C Sharp will load this file, you could be toast. PHP, the language that I love to hate, has even more stuff. Uh, and you can do this if it's enabled. It's, it's not enabled by default, but you can use PHP to do an SSH2 command on another host, pivoting through a web system. Might be useful someday, but probably not for what you want to do. So think about that there are other protocol handlers in whatever language that you use. It's not only going to be HTTP and HTTPS. Number six, wise men don't need advice and fools won't take it. Benjamin Franklin probably didn't have a computer and certainly didn't have computer security problems. But this is about standards. And standards are, it's, it's a whole nother beast for software developers. But when a software developer or an application developer needs to use a standard as a client, you need to follow that standard. If you're gonna uh, write a server following a protocol or a standard, you need to follow the standard. So we have standard specifications, okay? XML specification, 59 pages, yeah, not, not that bad. SMTP, 78 pages. HTTP, 119 pages. Ever wondered why NTF, uh, NF, NFS has so many security problems? Well, this could be one of the issues. 617 pages of standard specifications and Working in the telecom industry, as I've done, the, we have the ASNet, uh, ASN1, uh, abstract synthesis notation, almost 800 pages of specifications. What could possibly go wrong? So if you're not using a standard uh, framework for these things, but trying to do it yourself, read up, read a lot. But the problem is most developers just go, uh -huh. And they enter what I call the circle of bad code. And what that is, is that they get the new task and it's something related to a standard. They find a working solution somehow, Google, Stack Overflow. They test it quickly. Yeah, seems to work in my browser. Okay. They commit to changes and they pray to God that the next task is something else. All right, so an example. Say you're writing a web application and it, it, it displays, uh, displays some uh, sensitive information and your task is you need to prevent a browser from caching this to the browser cache. 
Okay, fair enough, seems reasonable. So how do you do this? Okay, we, we look at Stack Overflow. You send meta tags. This is the number one answer on Stack Overflow for this. This doesn't work. So if you do this, you've done it wrong. Okay, should we send some HTTP headers? Someone told me, yeah, you should, you should just send some HTTP headers. Okay, cache control, no cache. Cache control, no store. Pragma, no cache. Cache control, private. They all look the same. Which one is the right one? Well, it turns out that the first one is a non-standard. It works in some versions of Internet Explorer. Pragma, no cache. It's not really defined for responses. It's defined for requests, but it works in the Internet Explorer. And cache control private, it's not intended for browsers at all. It's intended for proxy servers. So the correct answer is cache control no store is, is the, 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 the solution, but it doesn't work for IE8 in under HTTP 1. So you have to send the non-standard one as well. And this, you have to read up on this to get to know that this is the way to do it. And you need to read all these boring standard specifications to know how to do it properly. You can't just Google a solution and see that, ah, it works for me in my browser. Moving on to number five. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. This is, of course, related to input and input validation. And we know all, all know that input validation is important, but still, it's still a problem. I see it every day that I'm out reviewing code, and the most common problems that I see is either you're not checking at all, or you're looking for incorrect input. And looking for incorrect input is like trying to outsmart the attacker before it starts attacking. It's really, really hard. Uh, my recommendation is start looking for correct input instead and throw away everything else. Your application will, won't work that, that well in the beginning while the testers are starting to, to do stuff with it, but you can tweak your, tweak your input validation until it works and just throw away everything else. It's much easier that way. Regular expressions are your friend doing this. If you don't know about them or don't know them, learn, really, really powerful and develop a strategy for dealing with invalid input. If you're writing a web API, how should you react to, to invalid input? Should you always send an error code? Should you log it? Yeah, of course you should log it, but develop a strategy, communicate the strategy so that everyone does the same thing. There are some pitfalls though. Two of them are alternative representations and data in places you didn't expect. So I'll give you an example here. Say that you're tasked with writing a browser plugin that takes a URL and prevents the user from going to the Pirate Bay. Fair enough. So we just filter out the word, the Pirate Bay. Are we done? No. You could also go towards the IP, right? We're, we're, we're skipping like, uh, proxy servers and stuff like that right now. But you could do, go towards the IP as well. Are we done? HTTPS, yeah. Let's just say we're, we're filtering on the IP address without the protocol. Ports, hmm, not really what I'm out after. Or if, if you are filtering on, on just the string, the, the IP or and the, the word, the pirate bay, Sorry? Yes. How many of you knew that you could use that as an URL? Not that many. That is the 32-bit representation of the, of the IP address. And it works perfectly to, to go to the address like that. And if you don't know about that while writing your Pirate Bay filter plugin, you won't, 
you won't succeed. Not entirely. It's just an example. It's just an example of, of, of that there are some, there could be some representations of the same thing that you don't know about. Data in places where you didn't expect it. Uh, three weird examples. Well, in this crowd, it might not be that weird. Uh, in developer converse, conferences where I usually speak, this is weird. Uh, don't trust DNS records. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was uh, a couple of guys that were experimenting with serving Java co uh, JavaScript code inside DNS queries. So they had these pages that were somehow using uh, information from the DNS and just displayed, displayed it without filtering. So they had cross-site scripting attacks through DNS. It was pretty cool. USB, uh, Travis Goodspeed, uh, Awesome guy, uh, talked uh, last year at uh, sectians.com, uh, probably spoke about it earlier as well, uh, about a hardware board called the Face Dancer that he has developed that enables the, the user or the, the pen tester to impersonate any USB device and then send the data as that device. And that enabled him to impersonate like a 15 year old keyboard loading the 15-year-old keyboard driver, which totally didn't expect his input because it, it was supposed to talk to its own keyboard. And he found lots of vulnerabilities in old drivers that weren't supported. The companies don't exist anymore. And no one will ever fix the driver in Windows whatever. Log files, uh, we did a, I don't remember, if, I think it was a pen test, uh, where we managed to send PHP code in the HTTP header, and it was logged to a, a patch log file, which was browsable. So you could just open the, the log file and you had shell immediately. So you shouldn't trust like, uh, stuff like that, and you shouldn't, and that was not even their fault. Their fault was that they exposed the log file, but Nothing, nothing, nothing really happens, or what should I say? Uh, they, they shouldn't have displayed the, the, the log file, uh, and they probably needed to, to log the, the header, file, header fields as well. So there can be data. The, the point is there, there can be data where you don't expect there to be data. So moving on to number four. There is an art of reading as well as an art of thinking and an art of writing. And this is when dealing with files. And this is somewhat related to input validation but with the twist. As long as you as a developer are starting to reading and writing files, you need to be careful. I have seen many, many exploits going towards files and files reading and writing because it's a perfect way to get stuff out of, uh, out of your system. The most common mistake that I've seen uh, at clients are directory traversal attacks and file upload problems. Uh, so we have this example, uh, it's a Java example. Some kind of code that fetches your user profile given your name or username, and it creates a file reader and it adds a base path over here, uh, adds the name and then .xml, and then starts reading it. Okay, fine, so if this was a web application, which it was, you could do this and it would read the correct file. Fair enough. Then we start doing directory traversal attacks towards that, dot dot slash admin secret but it still adds the .xml at the end. And here is the twist that I didn't expect to work, but it did work. Null byte poisoning towards Java. Java totally respects the null byte uh, for the file reader uh, at least, 
and ends the string there, leading to you not to append the .xml in the end. The newer versions of, uh, of the IO interface is protected against this, but there are a lot of legacy applications that still use this. So I w totally wasn't expecting an, an Albyte to work in a string in, in Java, but it does. So it's pretty cool. File uploads is always a problem. Um, how should you validate what is sent? I mean, if, you, if you're trying to get the user to upload an avatar or something, can you trust the content type header? Well, no, it's not. It's sent by the, by, by the client. Can you trust the file extension? No. It's also selected by, by the client. Can you trust some magic bytes in the file? Well, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, I enjoy playing uh, a lot of CTF uh, games, Capture the Flag, and in one of those exercises, we were able to upload a file as an avatar. They were only checking the magic bytes, not the extension which led us that we could inject scripts in the middle of the uh, image that would get ex executed on the server. So file uploads are really, really hard to validate. And not the least, if you are using some third party application for processing like an image or something, resizing it, there might be another problem inside that application that someone can use to get inside your system. All right, number three. Your password must be at least 18,000 characters and can't repeat any of your previous 30,000 characters. This is an actual Microsoft Knowledge Base article. <laughs> this has happened. You can look it up. This is about user management and it strongly relates to the previous talk uh, about sessions and stuff like that. I'll get back to that in a minute. But the most common mistake uh, when doing user management is bad luck while thinking. That and the fact that it's really boring to do. So it often gets handed over to inexperienced developers. And to them, user management looks like this. It's just a maze of stuff. And I can understand them because there are lots of design decisions that you need to take. Not only design decisions, but business decisions on how stuff is going to work. So let's see if we can find some words inside this maze and talk about them. We have password, salt, and hash. You need to decide how you are going to store your passwords. What salt are you going to use? Which hash are you going to use, if, if any, probably? <laughs> And you need to select some, some clip, something clever. Are you going to store your users in a database or in a file? Well, databases have their pros and cons. Files have theirs. Someone needs to decide. And an inexperienced developer might not be the right person. Sessions and cookies. How are you generating your sessions? How are you storing them on the client? How are you storing them? at the server side. Uh, and as the previous speaker said, should you store them as objects or just strings? Well, someone needs to decide. Probably the guy that's coding it. Administration. That's a really boring word. It's really boring to code as well. But you need to handle password resets. You need to handle how our help desk going to change users' passwords when they phone in. Are you going to use an unsecure random number generator to generate the code for the reset link? Well, someone has to take the decision. And if you were at the future banking talk, this is uh, also related. Brute force. Is, is, uh, should, should a user be able to try 50,000 passwords a minute? Or should you lock him out? If you lock him out, should you lock him out permanently or just for a couple of minutes? Well, what's stopping him from dosing the entire system if he has all the usernames in that case? I don't have a good solution for this, but someone needs to take a decision while they're coding.
Number two, and we're getting to the serious stuff right now. If you think cryptography is the answer to your problem, then you don't know what your problem is. Another Neumann, not related to the other one, from what I know, but we're talking cr cryptography. And doing cryptography as a software developer, don't ever invent your own cryptography. I've seen this a couple of times, never ends well. Don't implement an algorithm that you have read. Also never gets right. Never ever do this. My advice is get some help from someone who knows these kinds of things and use well-known libraries and algorithms. So an example, uh, one of the previous examples where I got in, uh, I could, r could write stuff uh, at the server, but they were like, yeah, but we have uh, AES encryption for the files and we are safe. And I was like, oh really? So it turns out that the these guys were storing encrypted information on the server. Uh, I can't really tell you what it was, but let's just say it represented value in the encrypted files. They didn't have the passwords, the encryption passwords, the clients had them. So it's pretty safe stuff. We, we provide the storage and you have your passwords and we can't touch your data. Okay. And encryption is pretty complicated stuff. Uh, you guys probably know it better than me, but if you don't know exactly how it works and why it works, you can run into some problems, even if you're using like AES or some other kind of approved encryption algorithm. So why, what I was prob um, po uh, could do with this was that I could do a bit flipping attack, which is where you can change the content of an encrypted file without knowing the key, as long as you know the content of the file. And as I knew the content of my file, Let's say the contents of my file was $1,000. What was stored was the encrypted value of $1,000. What we can do then is construct some magic bytes where we XOR $1,000 with $2,000. And we XOR that with the encrypted file. And these two guys, due to the mathematical properties of uh, XOR, they cancel each other out. And what's left is the encrypted value of $2,000. So I just doubled my money in the file without knowing the key. And the problem here that was that they didn't use authenticated encryption. And even when using authenticated encryption, there are three ways of doing it. And from what I gather, the preferred way is encrypt and then Mac. Message authentication code. You add a hash after you've encrypted yourself so that you know that no one has tampered with encryption, the encrypted data. But then there's the choice of encryption modes, even if you do stuff correctly. You have cipher block chaining mode, cipher feedback mode, counter mode, electronic code book mode. You have lots of choices here. Someone has to decide which one should we use. So if you have an image and you want to encrypt it and you encrypt it with CBC, you get this, well, fine. But if you're not careful and you think that, hey, I found something with a bit better performance and use ECB, you get this. And this somehow leaks some information about the picture that the information in, in the encrypted file. So you have to be really careful of using crypto. If you want to learn more, there's an excellent uh, online course uh, from Stanford. Uh, it's about a seven week course. It takes about a couple of hours each week. Uh, really good. And we'll get you up to speed to like the minimum level where you can know that you shouldn't be doing this yourself. Number one, the main problem that I have found, and remember this is, this is just my opinions from my experience, but the m number one reason or uh, thing that gets uh, software projects into trouble is described by this quote. You can't produce a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. There's a famous guy that said that. I think everyone agrees with me. There are, however, 
one category or perhaps two categories of people that don't agree with us in this. Any guess who that might be? Management and project leaders. They love increasing the amount of people working on a problem because it always gets done faster that way and it always gets better or, or not. So we have a, a, a saying in Sweden, I don't really know, know if it translates, but the more people making the food, the worse it tastes. And I think you all agree with me on this, uh, because when you increase the team size and you increase it to like 10, 15 teams with 15 pe persons per team, it's all about communication. And the pains that you, that you get is you get multiple interpretations of requirements, multiple interpretations of APIs and protocols, an exponential amount of connections between people, really difficult to establish a common language. What do we mean when we say, eh, the session is broken? What session? The file, the cookie, blah, blah, blah. And there's also a problem with responsibility. I feel with uh, large development teams. It's always someone else's problem. No, I thought you took it. No, I, I thought he took it. And my proposed solution is, if possible, use a small amount of really good developers instead of outsourcing it somewhere where you can get 10 developers for the price of one, or just increasing the, the team size. Use a small amount of developers if possible. I know as a developer you can't do, make the decision, but those of you that are in a position to, to, to command over this, consider it. That was my 10 points. Logging, try to implement logging early. Beware when you're using random numbers. Take care of what you put into your version control system. Be aware that there are different protocol handlers in many default implementations of frameworks. Use the standards appropriately. Always filter your input. Be careful when using files. Put an experienced person to do the user management features. Never do your own cryptography. And keep your development team as small as possible and as good as possible. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, after a point six uh, standards, uh, did you fix the Stack Overflow uh, answer, which uh, stated the wrong answer to the caching problem? No. <laughs> I did not, I admit it. I should do that, I promise. So, any more questions? Then one from my side. Uh, how do you get the developer team, or if you analyze the stuff, to go back and <laughs> fix it if they like wasted so much time and nobody wants to take responsibility? That's, that's, that's more of a project management issue. Uh, but I, I feel that if you're using smaller teams, people tend to take more responsibility. And if you're using really good people, they have a more, more of a pride in their work. So they, they often go back and fix stuff on their, their spare time. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, we, with dev team size, it's also a problem if the team's too small, right? Because then if somebody key who understands a particular piece of software goes, then... Yeah, it's a delicate balance. Yeah. And I, I'm not saying that, that my answer is a silver bullet. I'm just saying, don't, as a management, don't try to just push in more people when the deadline starts slipping because it hardly gets a better quality. I find it very interesting that you put the development team size first because adding manpower to late projects makes them later is really an uh, urban legend. And it's also my experience that this can be one of the worst problems you're facing. Um, yeah, any silver bullet to that or ideas how, how to transport that information? No, 
Unfortunately not. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, have, from your experience, have you, have you found things getting better or worse with teams develop, um, using agile processes? Uh, slightly better, I would say. Uh, but the, the main problem is still the same. Uh, you, you have a lot of connections and a lot of interpretations. And from the, the few places that are really big, I've, I've been working for a big telecom uh, com uh, communications uh, company that were having like one product with 27 man teams, all doing an entire day of planning each two weeks, and still having lots and lots of problems communicating changes. What are they doing? What are we doing? And lots of version control problems, merging, merge conflicts, people merging out each other's work because they, oh, it's not supposed to be there. We haven't written this. So it's doing large scale software development is really, really hard. I would say even, even agile. So any more? Oh, thanks. So now we're into the coffee break.